Welcome to Sam's Russian Adventures. I'm Sam, an English guy living in provincial Russia. Now, right now, we're about to jump in the car and drive over to my village because in today's video, I'm going to teach you all about how to move to Russia and build a house in a Russian village. Let's go. The weather is perfect. You might be wondering why there's so much sand everywhere. When I first moved here, I thought, are we near a beach? This is just the amount of sand they put down in winter because of the amount of snow. And then in summer, it looks like there should be a beach nearby. Now, I know a lot of foreigners dream about moving to Russia and romanticize about living in a house like this one. But is it really going to be much fun living in a house like that? So today I'm going to talk about everything to do with building a house in Russia. Everything from buying the land to building the house. But I'm going to start off with a very controversial statement which might seem a bit hypocritical. I'm going to say don't build a house in Russia. Apart from in two situations which I'm going to tell you about a bit later on. There he is, the half-built house. Let's go and have a look. I'm so lucky to have these trees on the land and also to have this little mini kind of wooded area at the end of the land as well. So my house is in the style of a barn house. So when it comes to buying a house in Russia, you're going to start with the location of your house. Where is the house going to be located? And it's generally going to be in a Russian village now. There's lots of different things you need to look at about the village itself. Because have you got kids? Do you want them to go to school in the village? Uh, is it far from the town? Are you going to have to drive there every day if the kids don't go to the village school or if there isn't one? Is there a shop in the village? Are there medical uh, centers and doctors and things like that in the village? Lots of different questions that you're going to have to ask yourself. Let's go and have a look inside. So this little road here, it's kind of like a pathway, is the road for the fire engines. In case there's a fire, they need to get down. So my fence will actually be kind of like here. So we're going in one of the back doors. And this will be my kitchen stroke living room. We'll have some stairs here going up onto the mini second floor where I've got a couple of bedrooms. And then this is the kind of like uh, unentertainment part of the house. We've got the boiler room here. This is the main door of the house. And this is the cloak room inside there. We then have a laundry room a third bedroom or perhaps an office something like that and the downstairs toilet so the reason i chose this particular plot of land was for the peace and quiet the amazing trees over here and i was planning to put a swimming pool just here so i actually built this house to the stage it's at now before sanctions and obviously since sanctions my life has been a lot more difficult so my house is currently stuck in the position that it's in building prices in russia have gone up an awful lot and therefore i'm not able to finish off the house at this current moment in time so i'm located in central european russia and in central european russia and northern european russia at the moment it's springtime so it's all a bit kind of like gloomy looking but i can assure you in winter and in summer this place is absolutely incredible. If you're a foreigner in Russia and you don't at least have the minimum residency, which is temporary residency in Russia, then the most amount of land you can buy is 1500 square meters. In Russia, land is measured by 100 meter square and 100 meter squares is called a sotok. One sotok from the word store, 100. 
So if you see land advertised in Russia, it will say the amount of sotoks, the amount of 100 square meters. So my land is 15 sotok, so it's 1500 square meters. Now I could have bought more if I wanted to because I'm a Russian citizen, but that was the amount of land that was available in this location. So there are different types of villages and settlements, but the names aren't really that important because in the past, a silo would have been a village with a church in it and would have had the main administration center. But now you get villages that are bigger than the silo, or you get settlements, which are a village that was transformed into something bigger than a village and perhaps housed some sort of Soviet industry back in the day. But now some villages are bigger than settlements, some silos are smaller than villages, so it doesn't really matter. What you need to pay attention to is the infrastructure of the village. One of the things you'll notice in any village is that all the plots of land, because they're owned individually, people build all sorts of different houses on them. So you can just see my house and my two neighbors, they're, all, they're completely different. And if you've got a, a plot of land ahead of you that's owned by somebody else, they could build pretty much anywhere on that plot of land. So you might have an amazing view, but then your neighbor that's got the plot of land ahead of you might build a, a three floor house on there and block your view completely. So you've really got to be aware when you're buying land of the kind of difficulties and the situations you could be involved in. One of the things you need to look at when you're buying land is what communications come with the land. Now in Russia, this is called komunikatsi. And so the communications are the gas, the electricity and water. If the plot of land that you're buying is somewhere maybe on the edge of town or in a big pasiolok, then you may have central communications. Central communications mean that maybe your water will get hooked up to the town so you'll be able to use the hot water heating from the town and the gas and you won't have to make your own plumbing and your own water system. But generally, when you go outside of town, you won't have communications centralized. So if you look over here, we've got a yellow pipe sticking out of the ground, which is a gas pipe. And if you look up here, we've got electricity. So my plot of land came with gas and electricity. But in order for me to connect the gas and electricity, what I need to do is I need to get the planning permission for my house and show exactly how the gas will be connected, how the electricity will be connected, show all the safety features, and then someone will come out and they will connect my house to gas and electricity. And then once a year, they'll also come and check and make sure everything is fine and put their signature to say that everything's safe. So let's take a little bit of a walk around the village and look at some of the other houses. When it comes to planning permission, planning permission isn't really something that's so strict like in the UK. I don't know what it's like in the US, but as I've said, look, and as, as I've shown you, there's all different types of houses here. So it's more of a formal, what's the word? A formal thing that you have to do just to get the documents. It's very rarely that someone's gonna say, no, that type of house can't be built unless you're building in perhaps like a historic town where all the houses should look the same or something like that. So what are some of the things you need to be aware of if you're gonna buy a plot of land? First of all, how developed is the actual village itself? As you can see, a lot of the people on my road are still building. I'm lucky that most of them have actually built their main houses, but you can see there's building materials all over the place. And if you're one of the first people to buy a piece of land on the road, right, then potentially you could be living on a building site for a number of years. So that's something you really need to take into consideration. Do you want to live on a building site? The next thing is the road. If you can see the road here, we haven't got asphalt down yet. We've kind of negotiated with our neighbors and we've all, well, most of us have put some sort of stones down, which is like a temporary thing. You can see here that these neighbors have just got loads of like stuff everywhere. Mm. So some of the other aspects you wanna look out for if you're purchasing a plot of land in a village is gonna be the services and the infrastructure of the village. Does it have a house of culture? So somewhere for you and the family or the kids to go and learn about things and take part in events. Does it have like a club or something like that? I don't mean a nightclub, I mean just like a, you know, a, a village club. Does it have a police station? Does it have 
uh, possible like uh, medical building where you can go and get I don't know injections if you're feeling ill or you need a coronavirus injection or something. Does your neighbour have a dog? If you're not a dog person is it going to drive you wild? Some bigger villages might have schools or nurseries where you can take your kids but the majority of smaller villages won't have them so you need to think how are you going to get your kids to school? You see the thing is most kids or most families will have actually lived in the town first so they would already be going to a particular school so it's not like in the UK where everyone will go to a school that's nearby from the village so the chances are that your kid will be going to one of the schools in the town and they probably won't be going to the same school as your neighbours so you'll need to find a way to get them to the school you'll either take them to school every day yourself or you'll put them on the bus how often does the bus come then they'll need to change buses once they get to the town the next thing you've got to do is think about internet and phone is there a good phone connection is there a good internet connection you need to speak to the neighbors one of the things that i did when i found this plot of land i was literally searching and searching and searching for a nice plot of land and i really like this area in itself and when i found this plot of land i actually rang the owner of the land for about a year and a half trying to convince her to sell it to me and eventually she agreed and by that time I'd made friends with all the people on the street I'd been around I'd found out everything I found out that we have high-speed internet that's been put in another thing you'll notice is most of these houses are actually higher up so the first floor starts a lot higher than ground level and the reason of that is because in a village you're out in the sticks right so the drift of snow and the amount of snow is much more than in the town in the town it's obviously cleaned a lot more often and cleared so in the village you get a lot bigger pile up of snow and so when the snow melts this creates an awful lot of water another thing you need to be aware of is are there any rivers or big lakes nearby because in springtime when the snow all thaws and the ice all melts you could have an awful lot of water and this could cause huge flooding it's so unpredictable as to how much snow there's going to be in a year this year we had a crazy amount of snow and an ice and so therefore in some places in Russia like we have now in Orenburg it's crazy the ice has melted the rains have become really heavy there's too much water and so we have flooding so you found the ideal plot of land you've done your due diligence I can never say those words together due diligence and you've decided you're going to buy that plot of land let's talk about prices prices you would think that there would be some sort of standard price right in this area you pay this amount of money for the land right per meter or whatever but when it comes to houses and land it really is about supply and demand how much are you willing to pay for land it doesn't really matter how much the land is worth it matters how much the seller of the land believes the land to be worth you could have a, a really nice area where it's really tranquil and really nice to live and so people want to live there so the price is going to be higher you could have an area next to the town which is pretty near to the city centre but it's not very nice maybe the ecology isn't so nice there and so the prices are lower and you could have plots of land that are next door to each other that are selling for completely different prices so it all depends on demand and supply so for example there's some areas around Moscow that are a lot cheaper than Vladimir which is really strange right because you're talking in the capital right in the region's capital area yet the prices are cheaper than Vladimir so together with our neighbors we've all put some money together and we've created this barrier that will hopefully stop people from coming in that don't live here but the thing is it's almost always broken we've also got ourselves a little camera up there look this is the road that runs parallel to my road let's take a walk down there this is something I need to touch on in fact quite often these housing settlements are built on the side of villages as you can see all of the houses that I've been showing you here they're all brand new but often what is the case is that the electricity supply to the village has not been upgraded at all so often it's overpowered and can just turn itself off and this basically creates outages power outages 
in the village. The only way really you can find out if this is a problem is to ask the neighbors of the plot of land that you're thinking to buy and they'll tell you about all the information usually about the things you need to know before moving to that particular area. So on my road, for example, we have a village chat. We have a chat for the road and then we also have a separate chat for the entire village. And so we discuss things we need to do on our road and maybe if we need to get somebody to clear the snow because this is something that's a real problem on our road. So the local administration sends people out to clean the snow, but it's not as often as required. It might be a heavy snowstorm. We need to get out. People can't get to school and stuff. So we hire somebody between us. We all put money together and we all pay for someone to come and clean the snow on a regular basis. And these are the things you can find out by asking the neighbors. Now this road here, all the plots of land were purchased before my road which runs parallel and so you can see what difference a, a couple of years building earlier will create but you can see just how different all the houses are right there's no real concept everyone's just built the style that they want the style they dreamed of so let's say you found your ideal piece of heaven your ideal plot of land and you want to buy it what do you do well you contact the seller obviously and make your offer if they agree then you can say look you know we're foreign what we'd like to do is we'd like to go to the notary and the notary will know all the laws involved right and they'll check the land and make sure everything's fine with it make sure there's no money owed or anything like that make sure it's registered to the person that they say it's registered registered to all the documents are correct if everything is correct then the next step is to go and register the land in your name and also to pay the best thing to do is to give a deposit but then open a bank, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, ah, I've forgotten the word. A safety deposit box, where you'll place the money in the safety deposit box and you'll write a contract with the seller, which states that upon completion of the registration process and the documents being put into your name, the seller then gets the key to open and receive the money. That's the safest way to do it because if the, there's a problem with the documents, right? If they can't be registered in your name, if there's some sort of scam going on, then the seller will not get the key to access the money and it will expire. You can put an expiry date, maybe 30 days or, or two months, for example. And if the documents don't get registered in your name in that time, then simply put, the seller will not get access to the money. You take your money back and you've lost nothing. If the seller is against this, then what's wrong? What's the problem? Well, quite often the seller won't want to put on the contract the real amount of money that they're selling the land for because they don't want to pay tax. But this really isn't a problem because you can make a separate contract for the house and then another separate contract for the money. So officially it looks like they're selling it for a hundred quid, but you can then make a separate contract upon completion of the documents. They get the amount that's in the safe. And no one really knows the amount that's in the safe apart from you and the seller because you go there together they can count the money beforehand it gets put in the safe you both have keys so you can't go to the safe in the bank and change the amount the seller has seen the amount of money that's gone into the bank into the safe and so therefore it's completely above board the documents might show that the person's selling the land for 100 quid but they could be selling it for 50,000. So everything's been successful, you've got your piece of land, you now own it, what next? What do you need to do? Well, as I said at the beginning of this video, I do not recommend anyone to purchase land and build a house in Russia, apart from on two occasions. The first occasion is if you speak Russian, you're married to a Russian, or you have knowledge at least of living in Russia for a long time and you understand how it all works. Because in Russia, everything is completely different. And when you're building a house, expect to be scammed in some way or another. That's all I can say. Everyone says the same thing. You can sign contracts when it comes to maybe one company building the whole house for you, or you can find a company to do the foundations, another one to build the bricks, the walls, another one to do the roofing, another one to do the interior, but expect to be scammed in some ways. 
Now it might be the same in the UK. I've never built a house in the UK, so I can't say. But when it comes to anything that you really don't know much about, you can guarantee there's gonna be other people that are gonna to try to maybe do it a bit cheaper, to try and make some money on the side. I remember we used to have a show in the UK where people would pretend to have a broken washing machine, they'd put hidden cameras all around, and then they'd call the company to come and fix the washing machine and the, the master or whatever his name is, the person in charge would mess around with it for a while, make up some lies and come and tell you that you need a new washing machine or that it's gonna cost a grand when knowing that all you need to do is just change something simple. And that's the problem when you're building something in a country that you don't understand or speak the language, it's gonna advance the possibility that you're gonna get scammed. So what's the point in this video then? What's the point if I'm telling you not to build a house in Russia? Well, I'm not saying don't build a house in Russia. I'm saying there's particular ways that you should go about building a house in Russia. And the way that I suggest you to build a house is to go to one company who's either building a whole perhaps gated community or building part of an existing village. When you go to a company who's building a whole settlement by itself, you've got huge advantages. There'll probably be, be a selection of perhaps 10, maybe 15 types of house that you can build. You can go along and see the whole project. Blimey, the dogs are going crazy here. There's dogs in every house. I couldn't imagine living here. Wow, there's two of these bean chods here. That's crazy. So the advantages of building a house or having a house built for you in a settlement where one company owns and builds the whole thing is that basically one company is going to do everything for you from start to finish no messing around they're going to go and get permission for example they'll have already got planning permission for you and all of that done you don't have to worry about any of that the infrastructure as well they're going to create the roads in between you might have security guard there you probably will probably will have a barrier that opens up and down you'll have a shop you might have amenities like a, a gym a school a crash obviously it depends on the size of the settlement but it's so much easier when you're just going and saying right what land is available this one this one and this one okay let's have a look at the land everything is fine choice of options of houses choose your favorite one you can make adjustments to those houses it doesn't have to be exactly like, like that but generally you'll pick one of those houses you'll decide on the interior you'll just work together close with the company that are building the whole project and it's going to be so much easier than go and doing it all for yourself from the beginning of purchasing land of going to the administration to get all the documents you need of requesting planning permission, calling the gas company to come and connect the gas and the electricity and all of that stuff. Because if one company is doing that, they're gonna do all of that for you. Now, depending on how big the settlement is, you'll get so many different types of amenities there, which will make such a difference. If you have a school, a crash, you might even have a swimming pool. Some of these big places, they might even have like a little lake there. They might even have perhaps a, a little beach to go swimming in, nice footpaths and little wooden bridges and all that kind of thing that you would expect in a gated community anywhere in the world. Really the amount of checks you need to do when you're thinking about purchasing a house or a potential house in some of these gated communities, or just check the area, check that the company building the community is a normal company, not going to go bankrupt. But a lot of the time, half of the houses will already be built. So essentially you're buying a plot of land with a half built house already on it. One of the things you need to make sure is how many pieces of the land have been bought already, because you don't want to be living on a building site if the, you're the first person to perhaps buy the land and uh, other people are a bit slow to start building and they end up just living on a building site for the next 20 years. That's not going to be fun. But the advantages of having your own house are much better than living in an apartment as far as I'm concerned. I grew up in a house, so I'm slightly biased, but you, know, you can put your own banya, you have your barbecues, you can put a pool in there, you can invite your friends around. It's so much better than living in the town in a, in a grey apartment block. Now, of course, you could still purchase a plot of land and get one company to build your house from start to finish. But in an area where the company are building the whole thing it's going to be so much more convenient because once your house is built you're not going to have just trash everywhere it's going to be so much better and so much easier to do when it comes to 
paying for a house to be built, it's best to pay in instalments. So you put a deposit down, or you might pay up front for the first part of the house, the foundations. Once the foundations are done, you'll have somebody come and check it, you'll check it, everything is fine, you pay for the next stage. And you do it like that in stages. I'd say that the most important thing before doing anything like that anyway is to get a good lawyer that will check all the documents and make sure you're happy with the payment methods, with uh, the times of payment, with everything first before going ahead. If there's something you're not happy with, then go and approach the company and say, I don't like this, can we do it differently? Because at the end of the day, you're the buyer, you've got the power. So make sure that you feel comfortable with everything that's happening. The difference between a company that's going to build everything and individual building is just stuff like this. You know, it's got a bricks left at the side and look at this road here. It's nowhere near being tarmacked or anything. You've got bits of rubbish just left here. If you've built a house in a gated community or in a community where one company has built a lot of houses there then you might have to pay some sort of monthly fee for upkeep maybe for things to be cleaned for the roads to be cleaned of snow for security and things like that but that ensures that everywhere looks nice whereas when you're building a house individually your neighbor could be a right nightmare they don't play by the rules they don't care about just throwing the or building materials outside the house and you have to live next door and look at all that rubbish all the time and it really is up to then the people to get together and tell this neighbor move all your crap I don't want to see that every day you might get people that refuse to pay for the road to be cleaned and you need to pay for the road to be cleaned anyway right you need to uh, clear that snow so you can get to get to work and there might be one neighbor that says I don't want to pay and there's nothing you can really do to make him pay and so he's going to get the road clean for free. You might get a neighbour that refuses to pay for the upkeep of the road, for example. There might be a massive pothole opposite his house. And he'll say, you know, sort the pothole out. And he'll say, I can't be bothered. And there's nothing you can do. You'll end up having to pay for the pothole yourself. And you're going to get people like that, that live on these individual pieces of land that really don't care. I mean, look at this wonder how long that's been there for is it ever going to get moved and then you've got all these bricks at the end maybe they don't need all the bricks maybe they're going to try and sell them but I mean it's not very nice is it I mean look at this nightmare I've just noticed this and if we walk down this plot of land here and I can walk on it because it doesn't belong to anybody look at this I mean obviously the person could not be bothered to dispose of his bricks properly so they've just thrown them down here and it's obviously such a shame that after a while this is going to start smelling you know someone could injure themselves and it's just a piss take isn't it right so now we're going to take a little walk into the old part of the village show you some of the infrastructure that's there we haven't got a lot to be fair but our neighboring village is the main village of the area and they've got a big supermarket they've got a couple of churches they've got a few banyas houses you can rent out all the kind of main immunities that you need in in life so this is the old part of our village as you can see and most villages are going to have an old part too unless it's a brand new settlement built by one company usually often these pieces of land are all sold on and then it just looks like a brand new settlement these here will be leftovers from allotments or from a collective farm so this sign here says a small but very angry dog so here we've got like a mini police station and it also kind of doubles up as a clinic we do have a mobile clinic that comes here they're right in the village chat that at this time the mobile clinic will be coming to the village so anyone that needs to can meet the, the bus that comes and get injections or anything they need. I remember it was a big thing during COVID. Our village isn't very big. I'd say there's probably 200 houses maximum. And uh, we've got a little shop, but the shop doesn't even accept debit cards. So it's just cash only. Check out the basketball rim. That's crazy. One final thing that you're going to notice when it comes to brand new housing settlements are 
the neighbours are not really actively friends. Everyone's got a wall or a fence and you kind of like don't really see each other. You'll wave when you drive past in the car if someone's out on the street but it's not really the same as an old Russian village with old houses where all the neighbours kind of get together every now and again. It's not really like that. You might have meetings if you need to decide something, if there's a problem you need to discuss. But generally now, the village chat, you'll speak to people on there, on your phone, and that's about it. come to a gated community I'm gonna try and blag my way inside let's see how well this works so I can already see the security guard are looking at me like I'm fucking there's no way I'm getting in here but we can have a look so look here, I'm just gonna blag my way in. So all the houses, as you can look, are pretty much the same. But you can see already that it's all gonna be probably finished at the same time. It's gonna have it's gonna have the good infrastructure. The road you can see is already straight. So I'm guessing within a year this will all be done, all the houses will be fenced off, and this is what I recommend if you're thinking of getting a house in Russia rather than building one yourself you go to one of these areas where one company has built the whole thing so as I come further down the street you can see different types of houses behind here let's go and have a quick look so look you can see all the houses on the street are the same so you probably have the choice as to whether to buy the house as it is and then find people to do the interior for you or whether you want it to be done completely to the stage where you can move inside. Now one of the great things about a place like this is that you know that your neighbours have probably a similar level of wealth to you. If you're thinking to purchase some land and you're going to build a house on it, you don't want to have like a massive mansion and then your next door neighbours have a really small house because your house is going to stick out like a sore thumb. You're not going to want to dare go on holiday in case, you know, they're going to break in and steal everything. And I guess the other way around too, you don't want to have like a two room shack and have all your neighbours as, as millionaires. It's just going to be uncomfortable to live like that. So here, look, we've got the plan can't see there being any kind of real infrastructure here just houses no shop or anything like that no school so I've blagged my way into another gated community but you can see how much different it is right everything's done the road is nice and you can see that all the styles of the houses are very similar and that's why I thoroughly recommend if you're wanting to build a house in Russia then you go down the route of building a house in a gated community or at least a community all built by one company because you're not going to live in a pigsty you're going to live in a nice area with infrastructure nice roads nice houses and everyone's going to have a pretty similar level of income also you'll notice here that everyone has lower fences well I say that until I got to this house here. What do you think? Do you prefer like this? Or do you prefer to build whatever you want? You can see immediately that it's just much a nicer place to live. I really do like the fact that everything is the same kind of style. With slight differences, you can see. They're not exactly the same houses. So I spoke to the lady, she didn't really want to speak to me, but she said you can buy houses here that are completely ready inside to be moved into, or you can buy them with just the shell of the house and you can decide what you want to have put inside. The company that built the whole area can do the interior for you, or you can find someone else to do it for you. It's completely up to you 
as to what stage you decide you want to uh, buy the house. And so there you go. This is another example of a housing estate, as I said, all built by one company, all the infrastructure done, clean, nice. I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about two new YouTube channels, both by British guys that have moved to Russia and have built their own houses. Both of them have built houses in an area which has been constructed by one company, like the place we're in now. And they're both living in them now. One guy is living in the south of Russia, not far from the sea. He's got an outdoor pool and we're all completely jealous of him. His channel's name is The Plastic Russian. I'll put the link to his video below, but if you can just go into YouTube and type The Plastic Russian, you'll find his channel. And he makes videos about his area and a lot about his house and about how difficult it is to move to Russia and build a house. So I think you'll be really interested in his channel. The second channel is a channel called Russian Travels. It's a dude called Martin who's also living in a community. I'm not sure if it's a gated community or not, but it's a community where one company has built all the houses and he's living here with his Russian wife and two kids. And Martin will also be able to tell you loads about moving to Russia and building a house in Russia. And actually Martin's in a bit of a bad situation right now because as of yesterday, there were huge floods in the area of Russia where he's living and his whole house and his whole street is basically flooded. Imagine like this area here where I'm walking on now, but it's all like little canals, absolutely crazy. So go and watch his channel, learn all about moving to Russia, about buying houses in Russia, about the steps you have to go through. They'll be able to tell you even more than me because I'm still building. They're already living in houses in Russia. So they'll be able to tell you that whole process. So the two channels are The Plastic Russian and Russian Travels. And also, if you've enjoyed this video, share it with your friends, give it a like, leave me a comment, ask me a question. And if you'd like to, you can also join my Telegram chat group. It's completely free, just sign up. And um, you can ask me any questions you want. There's quite a lot of banter in there. We've got about 600 people in there. And uh, just ask me any questions Russia related and I'll do my best to answer. So I hope that was enough information with regards to buying land and building a house in Russia. The next video that I'm going to do is going to be about just purchasing a house in Russia. It's been very difficult to find houses to film because people who have got nice houses, they don't want you to film inside. They don't really want people to know how well they live. And then people who have got awful houses don't want you to know how badly they live. So it's, uh, it's been interesting, but I've got that video on the way. So um, right, that's me signing off. I think the only other question you'd want to know is prices, right? And prices are a very difficult thing to talk about because everyone decides that their house costs the amount that they decide it costs. But in my next video where I show actual houses and we do a walking tour and show you around the house, I'll talk about prices and how much each of the houses that I visit actually cost.